Hello, good evening, good day, everybody, and welcome to a new episode of the Ask Abhijit Show. Today, we discuss science and technology and all that good, wonderful stuff. So before we get into it, as always, let me see who all is there with us. I can see Abhay, Shreya, Crazy Brain, Arnab, Akwan, Bhavesh, Nishchai, Durga, Haripriya, Yuvraj, Harbi on Wheels, Karan, Ritik, Dityahar, Sampriti, Shao Dog, FBI, that's nice, Anshuman, Nikhil Singh Negi, Sanat, Lishan, Karan Singh, Samarth, Insanely Boy, San- Sanantana, Yuvraj, Anurag, Hekar, Pushkar, Bimla, Om, Mr. Jesus, Rama, Ranga, Brio, Raj, and a whole lot of other, other, other people. Good evening, good day to all of you. Thank you for being here on this live show. So, today we discuss science, technology, and all that wonderful stuff. So, let, so let's see what all questions we have for today. Let's begin with question one. What is question one? Ankul says, why do all the space station centers, why are all the space station centers situated on the east coast of India and why not the west coast? Mm, That is interesting. Good question. Interesting question. So uh, when we talk about the various, it's not space center stations. These are the space launch, uh, the locations from which rockets are launched. And they are typically on the east coast of India. Let's take a look at the map. We should we shall begin today with the map. So here is the map. Let's see the east coast of India. So uh, we have something called Wheeler Island, or or nowadays it's called Kalam Island, APJ Abdul Kalam Island or something. It's uh, off the coast of Orissa, somewhere over here. I'm not sure where exactly it is. Uh, let us see Kalam Island. Where is that? Yeah, it's here, Abdul Kalam Island. So it's an island near. Of the east coast of India, this is from where from where you typically launch various rockets, and I, I'm sure there is one or two more of these rocket launch stations. So uh, this is what the place looks like, and uh, ISRO has a facility over here. There will be a place from which rockets are launched, and typically all of these places from where we launch rockets are on the east coast of India. Yes, and even when it comes to the US. The United States, uh, Cape Canaveral, Cape Kennedy, etc. It's on the east coast of the US, uh, the Florida coast. Even the French, they have their uh, place called Kourou, which is in French Guyana. Kourou over here. Yes, this little place. Uh, they launch their rockets from here, the Ariane rockets. It's on the east coast of the uh, of the continent of South America and so on. So the question is, why is this so? Why is it always the East Coast? Why not the West Coast, right? So, uh, first of all, let's understand what an orbit is. You launch a rocket to place things into Earth orbit. The Earth is round uh, uh, and you place things into orbit. So what is Earth orbit? It's when a satellite or a spacecraft or, or a space station or whatever is placed in a trajectory that goes around the earth at approximately the same height above the surface of the earth. So this is essentially falling so fast that you don't hit the the earth. You're falling in a forward direction. You're falling forward, not down. So you keep, and there is a certain thing called an orbital velocity, depending on the distance from the surface, you have a certain orbital velocity. So, So what you do, is you place a satellite or a, or an object in Earth orbit at a certain height, and you want it to go around the Earth at a certain velocity so that it doesn't fall down; it just keeps on flying. So what you do now? We know that the Earth rotates, right? We have day and night because of the rotation of the Earth. Now, in what direction does the Earth rotate? That is the question. The Earth rotates from east to west. And how do we know this? Well, where does the sun rise in the morning? Does it rise in the west or does it rise in the east? The sun rises in the east. And therefore, the earth is rotating towards the east from uh, in that direction. So that rotational motion of the earth, if you can use that in rocket launches, it will, pro- it, will, uh, it will give you an extra kick 
or an extra amount of momentum to the rocket. And if you make the orbit of the spacecraft in the same direction as the rotation of Earth, that, that has an advantage, right? So that's the reason why typically to make use of the additional boost that the Earth's rotation uh, gives you, you typically launch your rockets as close to the equator as possible and you launch them in the eastward direction. Now, if you have a, a, a rocket launch station on the west coast, for instance, and let's say you launch a rocket and the, and the rocket fails and it crashes down to the ground and you're going to launch it towards the east direction, it's going to end up crashing onto the mainland on perhaps inhabited territory, right? So you don't want that to happen. You want the rocket, if it fails, to crash into the ocean. And therefore, we launch rockets from the east coast. So in case something, we're going we're gonna to first of all launch them in the eastward direction. Yes, it will go up and it will go east. And then if the rocket fails, for whatever reason, it will crash into the ocean and not on some inhabited place, a town, a city, a village, or whatever, right? So that is the reason why the space launch stations of India and most other places are launched, are, are located on the east coast, so that if something goes wrong, the rocket can be safely crashed into the ocean and not on land. That's the simple reason. All right. Let's go to the next question. Kushi says, Recently, the James Webb claims that Big Bang never happened. What do you think about it? Okay. The James Webb Space Telescope makes observations. It doesn't make claims. Hmm? And the people working with this uh, on the space, te on this telescope, etc., they simply uh, handle it. They, uh, they ensure that it is pointed in the right direction from time to time. I mean, it has time slots available for various observations. So they ensure they do all the administration. They do all the pointing of the telescope in various directions. They do the maintenance work, you know, making sure that everything's working and so on. So the James Webb Space Telescope people, the crew, the people who are working, the scientists and engineers who are working on this project don't make any claims. They simply operate the telescope and ensure it keeps running properly and not a single second of time is wasted, right? Because time is precious. Now, the James Webb Space, Space, Space Telescope, as we know, has brought out, has given us lots of new images in the very short period of time it's been working, and it's already transforming the way we understand the universe. Now, based on some of these images, some people, some scientists, some journalists, etc., have made some outlandish claims, like the Big Bang never happened. It's it's uh, uh, bringing the Big Bang theory into question and so on and so forth. Yeah, that's what is happening. Some people are making such claims. Uh, you see that on the media that the Big Bang may have never happened. The Big Bang theory may be wrong and James Webb is upending science and astronomy and astrophysics and all that. All nonsense. So what's happened? It's the telescope has given us images of the oldest galaxies that are known to have existed, right? I mean, the oldest galaxies ever ever captured on photographic images, that's what we are seeing. The earliest galaxy that had ever been captured in a photograph was by the James, uh, was by the Hubble Space Telescope, which was launched in the 1990s, I think. I think 1990s or 1980s, whatever. It's an, it's an old telescope. It's still operational. So the oldest galaxy that it had photographed, were, it dated back to about, about 410 million years after the Big Bang. So that's the earliest known galaxy the, before the James Webb telescope became operational. And the oldest galaxies that the Hubble telescope photographed were rather primitive galaxies. They were, they were like blobs, they were not disc shaped and all that, right? So, point number one: the earliest galaxy thus far, before the JWST, was dated dates back to about four hundred and ten year, million years after the Big Bang. And secondly, the oldest galaxies that, that the Hubble photographed were not well formed galaxies. They looked like very primitive and, and diffuse galaxies, like blobs. Yeah. Now, the JWST has given us images of much older galaxies. The oldest galaxies that the JWST has been able to photograph date back to around, I think, 250 or so million years after the Big Bang. Close to 200 million years after the Big Bang. That's a giant leap forward. So we are sh seeing galaxies that are, that are really, really old, around 200, 220, 250 million years after the Big Bang. And secondly, many of these galaxies that the JWST has photographed are spiral shaped. They are not 
blobs they are well defined which means that they have been in they, by the even 200 million years ago or whenever whatever date it dates back to the galaxy was already well formed multiple galaxies which means they had been in existence for a longer time than than the time period that we know of 28 220 or 250 million years after the big bang so that tells us that the earliest stage of galaxy formation was earlier than what we thought or imagined or or believed until now it was believed that the earliest galaxies formed around 400 million years after the big bang and those must have been primitive galaxies and they would have taken time to to take well defined shapes like spiral shapes etc and now we are finding something very different the earliest known galaxies date back to around 200 or so million years after the big bang and they are already well defined they have got spiral shapes so that is like a big discovery for sure now does it prove the big bang never happened what nonsense what absolute utter nonsense it doesn't say anything like that the best evidence that we have from all the data we have collected over the past 100 or so years astrophysical data astronomical data etc the the um the evidence that we have from the uh, cosmic microwave background radiation all of this stuff all the theoretical evidence all of it indicates that a big bang what we call the so called big bang did indeed happen if we extrapolate back in time we find that the universe would have started as a big uh, as as a infinitely infinitesimally small infinitely dense infinitely hot point of of energy right everything would have been concentrated into that that is about 13.8 billion years before today i have explained many times why we why that's the best theory that we have and why all the observational and other exper- experimental and theoretical evidence indicates this actually happened yeah now the new discovery of these oldest galaxies dates back to about 200 or so million years after the big bang how can it indicate the big bang never happened it simply tells us that yeah our understanding of physics may not be entirely correct that galaxy formation seems to have happened significantly before what we thought it would at what time it would happen so maybe there is something new in physics in the initial conditions after the big bang etc that we are not aware of or that we have not considered or something like that it doesn't mean the big bang nearly never happened right so uh and the earliest all the observational evidence does indicate that there was a big bang kind of thing the cosmic microwave background radiation it's still there it indicates it is it is the signature after glow of the first light after the big bang right and so on so all these claims that people are making various people are making even scientists are making some some scientists are even making the claim that there is something uh, that 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 maybe the big bang did not happen or maybe the james webb uh, Uh, discoveries and images and observations uh, throw doubt upon the big bang theory no it is not so they certainly will make us think in different directions yeah and we will need to uh, understand and answer certain questions as to why we have well formed well defined galaxies so early in the history of the universe yeah so that these questions will have to be taken up and addressed satisfactorily answered satisfactorily maybe we may uh, maybe it has something to do with the nature of with the nature of dark matter or dark energy because much or, and, and about black holes did primordial black holes form very early and did did they end up being the seeds of supermassive black holes around which galaxies formed when would this have happened what does dark matter and dark energy have to do with this what is the i mean dark matter and dark energy are kind of dynamic in nature you know the compositions and and percentages over over the uh, periods of, of the of the universe's history have changed yes so all of this is exciting what these new observational uh, this new observational evidence is very exciting every time you find something that that makes you question what you thought thus far it's always exciting because it tells you how much more you have you still have to discover in physics so clearly there are some new uh, there is a, a lot of new evidence here which may make us which may throw some interesting light on dark matter dark energy the early universe the way the universe evolved and all that but it does not call into question the big bang that is still the best theory that we have and none of this puts even 1% of of uh, a doubt on the overall theory in the overall uh, history that we know of the universe the big the so called big bang cosmology yeah 
So yeah, it, it's it's not true at all. Some people have made this interpretation that the it, it calls into question the Big Bang theory, which is completely incorrect. Okay, Vinu says, uh, how do scientists know if an animal is extinct? Do they look everywhere physically and couldn't find that animal? The fantastic giant tortoise, which was believed to have gone extinct, was had been has been found alive recently. Yeah, okay. Um, how do you know an animal is extinct? Well, there are various criteria that have changed over time. I think at one point in time in the 20th century, the criterion was that the an, uh, if an animal or a species has not been observed for 50 years, then you can declare it extinct. That was one criterion. I'm not sure if it is still around that criterion. Uh, so what are the criteria that we use to, to say that an animal has gone extinct? First of all, there should be no more observational evidence of the animal. Let's say you're talking about a fish. Now, now some animals you can easily say that they are extinct some animals are very it's it's very hard to say if they are extinct or not for instance land animals are visible on land so it's easier to say if they are extinct or not compared to fish because fish you have to go deeper i mean under the ocean under the seas to find them and some fish live kilometers under the ocean the giant oar fish is a massive massive fish but it le it lives i believe several kilometers uh, at a depth of more than one kilometer under the ocean. Now, who's going to go down there and see it? So it's harder to tell whether such species are extinct or not compared to uh, species of animals that live on land. If you have a large animal, then it's easier to observe it. Let's say you have the cheetah, the Indian cheetah. We know it's extinct. The last time it was observed was more than 100, was around 100 or so years ago, maybe 90 years ago. In, in a densely populated region like the Indian subcontinent, if for the last 90 years nobody has seen an Indian cheetah, it means that animal is extinct. The cheetah is still known to exist in Iran, west of India, but in India it is extinct. So that, that's one, one way of doing it. Secondly, you see whether the habitat of the animal exi exists or not. Let's say a certain species of bird can only thrive in a forest that has a certain kind of tree. And now we know those forests are no longer there. We have eaten them up. We have deforested the land. And those trees no longer exist that can support the existence of this bird species. And if we know for sure that these forests are gone, then we can say with, with, with a great amount of certitude, with a large amount of certitude, that that bird also would have gone extinct, especially if there is no more observational photographic or, or anecdotal visible evidence that the bird has been uh, seen in recent times. That's, one, that's another way of doing it. So you don't look everywhere physically. You cannot go and map every single point and, and coordinate of the planet. It's not possible. But there are these rough criteria that we employ and it's they, they are not foolproof. You know, for instance, have you heard of the coelocanth? Uh, let me put the coelocanth on the screen. C-O-E-L-A-C-A-N-T-H. I believe that is the spelling. Oh my goodness, I got the spelling right. That is fantastic. Okay, well, let's see the coelocanth. So the coelocanth is a species of fish. It was believed to have gone extinct 66 million years ago with the dinosaurs. So this fish species was believed to be extinct for 66 million years. For 66 million years, we only knew about this fish from the fossil record. A massive fish. And then it was rediscovered. It still exists. It exists uh, in the Indian Ocean of the coast of Africa, of the coast of Indonesia also, I believe, and so on. And it was discovered in a fisherman's market where it was being sold. <laughs> yeah. So it's, uh, it's, it's like a stone, it's like a dinosaur era fish, but it still exists. It's, it's still caught by some fishermen and, and sold in, in fishermen's markets. Right, so this is an example of a fish that had not, and, and and the thing is, it lives deep under the oceans. It's not a surface fish. It's not a fish that you will see on the surface. It will be caught only once in a while when when people go really deep with their fish hooks and and whatever. Right. So it was believed to be extinct, and then it was rediscovered. So so that's an example. So this uh, declaring a species extinct is never foolproof. Uh, you may have species declared extinct that may reappear. For instance, there is this uh, creature called uh, the thylacine, right? Thylacine, T 
T H Y L A C I N E, which is a Tasmanian tiger. Where is it? Let's put it on the screen. So they have you have the, this beast called the Tasmanian tiger. I think it went extinct over a, about a century or so ago. It's not been seen, but you keep getting anecdotal evidence from time to time of people seeing this beast. It's an, it's a marsupial. It's uh, it used to exist in Australia, and the. It was in zoos and all, but it was hunted down by, I don't know, by, by humans or by dogs. I'm not sure. But it seems to have gone extinct. And yet from time to time, you have people reporting a sighting of this animal. And even in New Zealand, I believe, people have reported sightings of this animal in, in, recent, in reasonably recent times. Yeah. So it may so be that it's not exactly extinct, but the population is very low and maybe they are very shy and they stay out of, uh, uh, out of range of humans, possibly. Yeah. And then, of course, you have animals like the mythical uh, Yeti, the Migoi of the Himalayan region. I mean, locals in Bhutan, in Sikkim, in northern India, in Tibet, etc. They speak about this animal as if it exists. We've never actually seen one or captured one. But yeah, you know, there is anecdotal evidence that something is maybe around. Even the Indian army had uh, put out a tweet with uh, photographs of some mysterious footprints that are clearly not human in the snow yeah in in northern india in the himalayan region so it's possible that there are, there are species that exist that we don't know of that we have never really uh, obtained hard evidence of it's also possible that some species of animal that have been declared extinct may still exist so it is not a process it is not something that you can say for certain ever and certainly you cannot look everywhere physically to go and look for, for for such extinct species. So it's a statistical thing. You know, probably, uh, the, if the probability is very high that an ex animal is extinct, you go out and declare it extinct. And if it reappears, well, you change, you change that. Yeah, the, uh, the classification or categorization. Okay. Next question. Vishal says, will the comet Smith, mm, Swift Tuttle, Swift Tuttle, Will the comet Swift Tuttle, which is heading on a collision course with the Earth on 17th August 2116, end most forms of life on Earth? And is it true that the collision will be way more powerful than the explosion of a million nuclear bombs put together? Okay, this uh, comet Swift Tuttle, it appeared, if I am not mistaken, in 1992. 1992, I believe. And I'm not sure if it was visible to the naked eye, but it was clearly visible on telescopes and possibly even binoculars. So this comet appeared last in 1992. I think it is a period of 130, 133 years or so. And if you do the math, it it, it will appear in 2126, I believe. Not 2126, if I'm not mistaken. So this may, may not be... In, this 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 here date may not be entirely correct. It, it's probably 2126. Yeah, and uh, so people obviously take these things very seriously, especially astronomers, and all. So they, it's possible to calculate the exact date when a comet will be at the closest approach to Earth, right? Because of orbital dyna mechanics, dynamics, we can do the calculations based on uh, what we know, based on past data, observational data. So it was first calculated that uh, there could be an impact with Earth on 14th of August. 2026. Mm -hmm. Then more observational data was was uh, looked at. The calculation was refined, and it looks like it will not exactly collide with with our planet, but it will come quite close. It will come to about 70 times the Earth Moon distance. So the Earth Moon distance is 385 kilo, 384,000 kilometers. That's the distance from the Earth to the Moon. 384,000 kilometers. So multiply that by approximately 70, you will get the distance, the closest approach of this comet to the Earth in 2026, in August 26. So I'm not sure what exactly the date is. The hypothesized date of the impact was 14th August. I'm not sure what the new calculations say, but it's certainly in August 2026. So most likely it's not going to collide, but it's certainly a comet that needs to be looked at very carefully because it's a near-Earth comet. I mean, it's a comet that tends to keep coming close to the Earth-Moon system, which is always something you should take very seriously. Yeah. Uh, now, uh, let's say hypothetically this goddamn rock impacts the Earth. What's it going to be like? So first of all, it's uh, it's 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 a large 
comet it's it's uh, the the comet or asteroid or object that collided with our, our planet 66 million years ago the so called chicxulub impactor which wiped out the non avian dinosaurs that asteroid comet rock whatever you call it is believed to have had a diameter of, of about 10 kilometers 10 kilometers imagine a ball a football with with a diameter of 10 kilometers approximately that's what it was like right now this comet swift turtle i think it has a nucleus with a diameter of 26 kilometers that's two and a half times more than two and a half times the diameter of the chicxulub impactor which 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 was a disastrous cataclysm for us for 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 our dinosaur friends not for us we survived our ancestors survived so this swift turtle nucleus is 26 kilometers in diameter roughly now if you imagine that this thing impacts the earth at roughly 60 kilometers per second which is believed to be approximately the speed of the chicxulub impact so if swift turtle hits the earth at approximately 60 kilometers per second not hour second 60 kilometers per second is going to release about 30 times the energy of the chicxulub impactor now i don't remember how much energy the chicxulub impact released but it was millions of times the energy of the hiroshima nuclear test yeah so that's how it was so yeah if it happens it's going to be a massive massive cataclysm on a scale that's unimaginable to us it's going to cause a mass extinction for sure it's going to cause tsunamis that are several kilometers high and it's going to cause storms that are supersonic or hypersonic in nature and tsunamis that move faster than the, than the speed of sound supersonic tsunamis that are several kilometers high the entire atmosphere will will go will, will burn for a while you will have sulfuric acid rain and various other kinds of acid rain uh, you will have earthquakes that will that will go like way of the richter scale yeah the entire planet will ring like a ba- like a bell you will have tsunamis that circle the globe multiple times multiple times multiple times you will have storms that are unimaginable then you will have a nuclear winter a decade two decades or so and for some time the entire atmosphere will become like you know boiling hot it, it's uh, it's unimaginable that anything will survive but some species of animals or microorganisms or whatever will certainly survive it's going to be a very difficult and long and hard nuclear winter or asteroid impact winter eventually life will rebound after a few million years maybe 10 million years or so that will happen but if we are around when this happens it's all uh, it's curtains essentially <laughs> because even if we survive that the planet will be unrecognizable that's what happens so the best thing is to keep a very 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 close watch on these naughty planets that come so close to us and if there is any indication there's any that it could come too close to us for comfort then we need to take steps well in advance decades in advance yep so uh yeah so that's about this guy uh, this comet smith turtle a uh, swift turtle why am i saying smith <laughs> so this was last seen in 1992 uh, there were a couple of other comets very interesting comets in the 1990s uh, there was one in 1996 called hyakutake um that i saw myself as, when i was a kid very pretty comet to see then there was one called uh, hale bop which came in 1997 and both these comets were were very visible comets very bright comets uh hale bop has a period of about 2500 years so it will not reappear for another two and a half millennia and comet hyakutake which was very bright and very pretty it has a period of i think about 70000 years so it will reappear close to us in about 70000 years time these are called long period comets uh our comet over here swift turtle is not a long period comet just 130 something years 133 years so that is uh, pretty soon for a comet to reappear and of course there if you want to know what a cometary impact looks like you should look back to the event of 1994 the impact of comet shoemaker levi 9 which was torn to pieces by the gravity of jupiter in 1992 it broke apart and then a couple of years later in 1994 it hit jupiter bang 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 
the different pit, p- bits of the comet, the pieces of the, of the comet impacted Jupiter one after the other. And that's been captured on, on, on camera. You can Google that, what the image... Okay, let's take a look at that, what it looks like, shall we? Uh, Shoemaker-Levi impact. Shoemaker-Levi impact. Let's see what that looks like, if you want to see what that is like. It, it was a... Yeah, you can see this massive scar on the side of Jupiter. Now here you can see the impacts, the flashes of the impact, yeah? Multiple impacts on Jupiter. So it's the first time we ever captured on photo on, on camera uh, the impact of the collision of one solar system object with another. And you can see it was massive. So this is the kind of thing that would we would have experienced 66 million years ago during the Chicxulub impact, which, which changed the world forever. Right. So to summarize, this is happening in 2126. It's going to come close to us about 70 times the Earth-Moon distance. Hopefully not closer than that. And most likely we're not going to have an impact. But if there is an impact, it's going to end the world as we know it. End the plan- and transform the planet completely. Yeah. Okay, this is an extraordinarily long question. Oh, first of all, a request to all my dear viewers, my esteemed viewers, please keep your questions short. This one is a whole bunch of questions. Interesting questions, that's why, that's why I've taken it. I typically see questions like this, paragraphs long. I just don't take them because it will take a long time just to read it out. But I'm taking this because it's a, a bunch of interesting questions. Right. Let me see. It's quite small. The Goldilocks zone is defined as the ter- distance between a star to support water at most. The Goldilocks zone for any star is that region from the star at a certain distance from the star where liquid water can exist on a planet. That is the simple definition of Goldilocks zone. It has nothing to do with atmospheric pressure. The distance from the star where liquid water can exist. Uh, and um, so on. Okay, so what is the first question? Can life develop on a planet with different gravity than ours under circ- certain circums- circum- certain conditions? Uh, secondly, what would be the effect of periodic tidal gravity in a binary system, presence of a larger planet nearby on the development of life on a planet? Thirdly, what about a hypogravity world without surface water, but so presence of subterranean water and atmosphere? Okay, Jules Verne must be turning his brain. Okay, 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 okay. All of that. So, can life develop on a planet with different gravity than ours? Yes. Yes. Why do we think there could have been life on Mars? Mars has a different gravity than ours. It's, it's uh, The gravity there is much lesser than the gravity on Earth, but Mars is a prime candidate for life having existed, existed in the past because of the presence in the past of flowing water, large bodies of water on Mars. So yes, that's that's a great example, Mars, because there was once fl- lots of flowing water on the planet, even though the gravity is much less than that of Earth, it's a prime candidate for life having possibly emerged there, especially microbial life, microscopic life, etc. So yes, the answer, answer to question number one is yes, life can certainly develop on a planet with different gravity than ours under various conditions, under most conditions. Yes. Uh, secondly, uh, what would be the effects of a pre-periodic tidal gravity exerted on a binary system, uh, presence of a larger planet nearby, etc. You can have life on moons. Let's say you have there are various moons of Jupiter, Saturn. One good example is Uran- Europa. One is Ganymede. Then there is Titan. These are not planets. These are moons. And there is this presence of this massive gravitational pull of the of the of the planet around which the moon is going. In one case, there's Jupiter. In one case, there's Saturn. So the, yes, the, there is, there are tidal forces. The, there are tidal forces on these planets that are exerted not only by the planet around which the the moon is going, but also the sun. The sun also has a tidal effect. So there is a more complex dynamics on these moons, you know, tidal dynamics. And yet, life can certainly emerge there. Microscopic life doesn't care what sort of tidal forces are are appearing. So if you have a subsurface ocean on such a planet, yes, certainly you could have life. Yeah, especially if the... And the thing about these tidal forces, especially if a moon is really close to the surface, to to the surface of the mother planet, then you will have very strong tidal forces. These strong tidal forces can distort the entire shape of the planet itself periodically. And that can cause internal friction and cause heat, the production of heat deep within the planet, which can actually heat up the water, the subsurface ocean, if it exists. And that can, of course, 
be conducive to life. For instance, on our own planet, we have these uh, thermal vents, subsurface vents, several kilometers under the oceans, where you have essentially underwater volcanoes. And these underwater volcanoes produce heat. And that heat is something that is conducive to life. And we find various, various strange forms of life around these uh, these thermal vents, geothermal vents under the ocean. So something similar could happen if you have strong tidal forces that uh, produce heat deep within a planet, yeah, or or a moon, yeah, and that could heat up the subsurface oceans and be conducive to life. If especially if the right uh, molecules and chemistry is also present in in the water. Third, what about a hypogravity world without surface water, but presence of subterranean water and atmosphere? Yeah, even if there is no atmosphere, if you have a subterranean ocean like Europa, which is a hypogravity world, it's a, it's a moon. It's much smaller than the Earth, so you could call it a hypogravity world. Or Pluto. Even Pluto may have a subsurface ocean, which may be liquid, yes, liquid, and so on. And there's no atmosphere there, but there's water. It, it could be possibly completely dark. And yet, the, if you have a source of heat, and if you have the right chemistry, the right molecules, which may which is possible, then you may have uh, certain kinds of life, primitive life or whatever, maybe bioluminescent light. I'm, I'm just speculating. Yes. So the answer to question number one is yes. The answer of question number two is, uh, again, I gave it in number three also. Yes. So yeah, I hope that explains, uh, that answers the questions. Okay, Vinu says, can you explain the basics of Kaluza-Klein theory and how it was a precursor to string theory and why was it discredited? It's not been discredited. Okay, what is Kaluza-Klein theory? So we know, okay, to understand Kaluza-Klein theory, we have to understand dimensions. What are dimensions? Yeah. So gravitation was for the longest time understood from the Newtonian perspective as an inverse square force f is equal to g m1 m2 upon r squared right where r squared where r is the distance between the two gravitation gravitating bodies hmm? the two the two masses so uh, that was the newtonian approximation of what gravity is the newtonian way of looking at gravity and it is extremely accurate it is still very accurate we can still launch a rocket send it to the moon and bring it back with a uh, living people using just Newtonian mechanics. So it's still very accurate. Now in 1915, the general theory of relativity came out, uh, Albert Einstein, in which gravi gravitation was seen as the curvature of space-time. So a new dimension was introduced, the, the fourth dimension, the dimension of time. Yeah, And then gravity is the curvature of space-time and so on. Mass tells space-time how to curve, and the curvature of space-time tells mass how to move. This is geometrodynamics and so on. Yeah. So Kaluza-Klein theory came around, came out around this time, a slight a few years after the general theory of relativity. Now, what is all this about? So let's first understand what are dimensions. Dimensions. So let's say I am I am sitting a let's say I, will, I I'm sitting in my office. Yeah. And I want my friend to come there. So I have to give my friend the location. The location. Now let's let's. Uh, um, one second. Let me put something on the screen. Let's see what a coordinate grid looks like. Yes. This is a coordinate grid. The x axis and the y axis. So let's say you superimpose this on the map of a city. And let's say all of these lines, yeah, the horizontal lines and the vertical lines are streets of the city. So instead of giving names to my streets, I'm going to give numbers to my streets. Yes. So the horizontal lines are streets that are lying in the east-west direction. And the vertical lines are streets that are in the north-south direction. So let's say I tell my friend that I am at the building that is at the inter intersection of the fourth no, of the fourth north south street and the third east west street so then my friend will have the exact location of where my building is where my office is located so i have given two dimensions i have given my location in two dimensions to my friend and that is an exact location but what if i am sitting on the 18th floor of my building 
then i will also have to specify one more location to my friend one more coordinate one more dimension the third dimension that i am on the 18th floor not on the ground floor so now i have provided my friend three different dimensions length breadth and height yes but what if i am available only at 3 pm in my office i won't be there at 3 5 so i want my friend to come to these three coordinate dimension these three coordinates exactly at 3 pm so that is the fourth dimension i am now offering the fourth dimension the dimension of time so the thing about the the three spatial dimensions is that you can revisit them any time you want but time is something that flows and times is something time is something you cannot revisit yeah it's something that's only controllable in the future so you can be at some place in the future at a certain time but you can't be at that place in the past at a certain time so these are the four dimensions that we know of the four space time dimensions the three dimensions of space and one dimension of time now what did kaluza and klein do they said what if there is a fourth spatial dimension so in general relativity there are four dimensions three space dimensions one 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 time dimension kaluza and klein it's a long story how the entire theory developed but what they essentially said is wh- what if there is the fourth spatial dimension which brings the total number of dimensions to 5 but then the question is if there is a fourth dimension of space why don't we see it we only see three dimensions why don't we see it so they said what if this is a microscopic dimension what see if you are um, okay let me show you the map again and uh, let's go to uh, to the earth so here we are uh let me share that i'm sorry one second give me a second to share it on the screen here is the the earth so let's say i am sitting on the equator of the earth and i start walking east or let's say i sit on a plane a rocket plane very fast and i go east so i'm starting over here at this point right beneath this uh, the southernmost point of india i'm going east i'll keep going east 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 a little more and i am back where i began so kaluza and klein said what if there are dimensions that are ultra microscopic in scale and they are curled up in such in such a form that they reconnect with themselves so a dimension that is circular essentially in shape you start at one point one one place in the dimension you go and you will end up in the same place what if you have these ultra compactified dimensions and what if the fourth spatial dimension s p a t i a l spatial dimension is an ultra compact dimension that is curled up onto itself yeah so let's say you you make a circle but you make it so small that it just looks like a point that sort of thing so from far away it looks like a point so maybe there is a fourth space spatial dimension but it is so small and so curled up that you don't observe it with the senses that we we possess maybe it is let's say a millionth of the size of an atom of a hydrogen atom how about that hmm? so that's what they proposed the, they said what if we do this what if we introduce a fourth dimension and a total fifth dimension yeah and let's see what the math tells us what what will the properties of the universe be like if there is a fourth dimension of space so they worked out the math and they found that the force of gravity what we perceive as gravity in in general relativity when you introduce a fifth dimension like this the effect of gravity in this fifth dimension is that it produces what we call electromagnetism so even though this dimension is so small so compact and essentially undetectable to us if such a f- fifth dimension exists then it is this the effect of gravity in this dimension that will generate what we what we feel the force that we call electromagnetism so those materials that are affected by electromagnetism they move in this dimension and whatever is not affected by it does not move and so on so that is kaluza klein theory and this remained like a mathematical curiosity oddity artifact for the longest time it was like very interesting but what do you do with it and then string theory appeared 1960s onwards 50s 1960s onwards i believe 
and then they took kaluza klein the kaluza klein idea and they extended it the thing about string theory is that the theory itself predicts how many dimensions of space time should exist it says there are 10 dimensions 10 dimensions in total so this was essentially something that took the kaluza klein formalism further ahead in in a, in a certain way and then again those extra dimensions are uh, uh, they are compactified dimensions just like kaluza klein and uh, had thought so that is how so that is what kaluza klein theory is that is how it was the precursor to string theory string theory extended that idea further and and borrowed the concept of compactified dimensions from the kaluza klein theory it's never been discredited it still is something that you should study if you're a physicist yeah it's a very interesting thing i mean the 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 force of electromagnetism emerges out of out of the, out of the fifth kaluza klein di- uh, dimension it is the effect of gravity in this dimension that gives off gives rise to what we perceive as electromagnetism that is what this theory says it's obviously not a complete theory yeah it's been extended into what we call string theory but string theory itself is far from perfect but these theories which may not be completely perfect and not be complete give us ideas about how we can proceed further in 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 uh, in trying to tackle the big problems and big missing pieces of the jigsaw puzzle when it comes to physics because we understand very little of the universe even now and we need to delve deeper into it so so yeah that's what it is it's never been discredited it's it's uh, it's been extended further and many of the ideas were borrowed and incorporated into string theory so it's not a theory that's been discredited it's a beautiful theory it's it's i think every student of theoretical physics should study it all right Bhavesh says if we can't beat the speed of light then how do the ufos if they are real reach the earth from alien planets hmm good question i like it so the closest star system to us is the prox- is is proxima centauri which is roughly 4. Point something light years from here which means that if i shine a laser beam at proxima centauri it will take 4 or so about 4 years to reach there that light yeah so uh and if you use a chemical rocket or a light sail technology or whatever at one tenth of the speed of light let's say you use light sail technology that can accelerate your spacecraft to 30% of the speed of light even at that speed it will take 30 to 40 years to reach proxima centauri and if you use your good old chemical rockets it will take hundreds of thousands of years to reach there so that's how big and vast and vast and empty space is so let's say you have aliens who have these craft spacecraft which we call ufos and let's say the ufos actually exist let's say hypothetically we don't sure but let's say the ufo phenomenon is a real alien spacecraft but then then the question is that most likely there's no guarantee that proxima centauri is where they're coming from they could be coming from much further away from within our galaxy or maybe from beyond our galaxy who knows so maybe they are traveling hundreds of light years to come here maybe thousands of light years maybe millions we don't know so if we can't beat the speed of light it means that they would have taken millions of years to reach here or thousands of years i mean that doesn't make sense because usually as far as we know biological lifetimes are short so how do they do it are they so patient i mean if they have long lifetimes are they so patient they will wait so long so so how do these ufos reach our planet will reach the united states from alien planets hmm? so let's examine various scenarios first the first scenario is the simplest scenario that they don't exceed the speed of light they come at sub light speeds maybe 10% the speed of light maybe 30% of the speed of light and maybe the aliens who travel in these spacecraft they have extremely long life life spans perhaps maybe each alien can live let's say 10000 years and they spend 1000 years coming here which means that they are spending 10% of of their lifetime in on a one way trip let's say they are willing to make the investment of time so that is one possibility maybe the the trip takes 10000 maybe the trip takes 1000 years one way and maybe they are willing to make the investment of time which is a very implausible scenario but let's there is one one scenario one one possibility the second possibility is that they don't they cheat they cheat cheating they do cheating they don't travel through space time at faster than the speed of light they make holes in space time and they use what we call wormholes to to take a shortcut between two very far away regions of space time so i've spoken about wormholes multiple times these are like 
Einstein Rosen bridges yeah and uh, well the physics says that it's it's uh, the wormholes don't want to stay open they want to snap shut and they will snap shut at, and create two singularities which are, which are black holes or white holes black holes most likely mm-hmm. so wormholes can exist yeah F- according to physics it's allowed but they want to snap shut they won't don't want to stay open so then how do you keep wormhole wormholes open you may have to put some exotic matter in a wormhole that will prevent it from closing maybe negative mass that will repel the walls or throat of the wormhole and keep it open that's one possibility secondly you may have to insert or you may have to make use of the hypothetical cosmic strings topological defects that were that were left over from the beginning of the, the birth of the universe possibly that so maybe aliens have discovered these cosmic strings and then they've built wormholes around that so that the wormholes simply can't close shut and then they, they would use that and that's a possibility so maybe they have they have uh, discovered wormhole technology so they may live on a distant galaxy maybe a billion light years away but they know these humans are there and we want to visit them we want to pay them a visit so they create a wormhole they open it and they take they take the shortcut and instead of uh, a billion years to reach here at the speed of light it takes them 3 weeks traveling through the wormhole yeah maybe <laughs> so that's the other possibility the third possibility is that they have invented warp drives warp drives are when you essentially sit in a bubble of space time that itself moves faster than the speed of light and it, in a in a way that does not break the laws of physics hmm? so warp di- drive technology or hypothetically it may be possible the alcubierre drive and various other solutions of einstein's field equations which may allow uh, allow warp drive technology to exist if you can well make it happen which is way way beyond our capabilities but maybe the aliens have it and maybe they use warp drives drives like in star trek yeah so one possibility is that they actually come they actually travel at, at speeds much lower than the speed of light and they take a very long time to reach it that's possibility one possibility two is that they have wormhole technology and they can appear here in a matter of days or weeks from billions of light years away and thirdly they may have warp drive technology so these are the three possibilities i can think of and obviously they seem to love the us greatest country in the world then they all come to the us and they bypass all other countries so yeah that's what i can um, offer you in terms of possibilities and scenarios next question okay atmaj says if we have explored only 5% of the oceans then is there a possibility of finding a trench deeper than the mariana trench mm good question let's put map where is the map where is the map here's the map so where is the mariana trench let's put the satellite imagery oh clouds i don't want clouds i want trenches so let's dig deeper let's go to the philippines philippines yeah so where is the mariana trench it will be somewhere around here can you see these deep trenches these are at the edges of various tectonic plates where tectonic plates you have subduction zones etc and this is where you have volcanism and earthquakes and stuff like that so let's search for the mariana trench m a r i a n a space t r e n c h it will be somewhere there where i saw where i went okay where is it let's zoom out zoom out zoom out zoom out zoom out bro yeah close to where i was here it is so the mariana trench is known to be the deepest point in the oceans anywhere on the planet and it's near guam near the philippines the caroline islands near palau and so on so it's at the intersection of these two zones and if you go if you look here it's like a deep 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 trench yeah like you have in mountains a deep trench so that's where it is it's it's most likely it is it is mostly it is it is definitely the deepest point that we know of in the oceans on our planet so the question is if we have explored only 5% of the oceans is there a possibility of finding a trench deeper than the mariana trench i think the possibility is is definitely it's a thing but it's not it's a remote possibility when i say that we have explored only 5% or so of the oceans it means that we have explored only 5% of the life forms and all that on the oceans but we have a very good idea of the subsurface sub ocean topology of the planet and it has been very necessary to map out all the ocean floors in great detail because of submarines 
various countries operate submarines for military purposes. The US, the USSR used to do it. Now you have Russia. Then you have the Chinese, you have the North Koreans, you have India also operating submarines. And to operate submarines, you need to know the ocean floor in extremely great detail. Otherwise, you're going to run into, an, an, into a subsurface mountain or something. You don't want that to happen. So we have extremely detailed maps of the surface of the ocean. We know what the surface of the ocean looks like on maps. But nobody has actually gone there. Right? Nobody has actually gone there and seen on the surface of the oceans and seen, seen what lives there, what sort of life is there and all that. So we have detailed maps. Very reliable detailed maps of the, of the, of the bottom of the oceans. And yet we don't know what is there. We know what is the geography, what is the topology, what are, what are the topological features, how tall the mountains are, how deep the trenches are and so on. But we don't know what is there. That's what I mean by we haven't explored much of the oceans. Right? So most likely this itself is the deepest point in the oceans. Most likely if we find something else to be the deeper, deeper than the Mariana Trench, I will be very surprised. So that's what I meant by we have explored only 5% or so of the oceans. It means how deep have we gone? What kind of life have we observed? And, and stuff like that. Most of the subsurface world is unknown. So over here also we have this. So essentially when you have islands, they are the tops of, of underwater mountains. The Andaman Islands are the tops of these massive mountains that sit on the surface of the ocean, that rise from the surface of the ocean. The Lakshadweep Islands are again the topmost parts of these subsurface oceans that rise from the surface of the planet under the oceans. And the same goes for the Maldives and other places, right? Right, so that in short is the answer. Most likely we will not discover any other place that is deeper than the Mariana Trench. Most likely. Okay, Ali says, when it comes, no, what comes after the silicon processes? Currently, we are in the phase of five nanometer silicon processes, and soon three nanometer silicon processes will be available. What comes next when traditional silicon chips reach their maximum capacity around one or two, uh, around one nanometer or two silicon atoms? Will there be another new material for processors or some kind of change in silicon has more potential? Uh, is there any way to use quantum computing for usual daily use like graphics, gaming, etc.? Lots of questions. Okay, let's talk about silicon processes and what comes next. So when we talk about silicon processes, microprocessors, and um, these chips and all that, we are talking about transistors. We are placing transistors on silicon chips, silicon wafers. So these assemblies of transistors are we're packing lots and lots, enormous numbers of transistors in very small, very small into a very small surface area, right? And so that's what a microprocessor is. That's what a silicon wafer, silicon chip is. It's all these electric electronic circuits, all these transistors, massive numbers of transistors on a very small surface area. And according to Moore's law, the uh, computing power, computing uh, the maximum computing power is said to double every two years or so, right? And that's what the trend has been thus far. But we are now reaching the limits of the capabilities of silicon processor because we are going, we are going to almost the atomic level. And when we reach the scale of just a couple of atoms or so, uh, what we are doing is we are using electrons in all of this, right? We are um, all of the data that we have is stored on these silicon. Uh, chips and it's in the form of electrical pulses. So all the data transport happens in the form of electrical pulses. All the processing, all the computing, it is all in the form of uh, electrical pulses. It's electrons that we are using. And when you pack so much, so many transistors into such a small place and when, when you do the processing, heat is generated. Heat. So the we know our computers become hot, our phones become hot because of the, all this heat that is generated as a byproduct of all this processing that we do using electrical pulses, right? Now, when you go deep down into the atomic level to the scale of two nanometers, one nanometer, yeah, when you go down to the scale of just a few atoms, there are certain limitations that you encounter. First of all, when you're using electrons to do all this processing, you run into this process, this, this problem called quantum tunneling. It's a quantum phenomenon in which electrons do things you don't want them to do. 
they go through walls and you don't want them to go through walls so what you have is copper wires and electrical pulses that's what we are using on these silicon processors and we are now coming very close to the limits so the other material that you can think of is germanium i think the first first such processor was actually a germanium processor it was it was it was built on germanium on a germanium chip germanium chip germanium is also a very good semiconductor right the thing is that silicon was then adopted as the standard because silicon is readily available germanium is not that readily available and then all the technology was built over the past 40 50 years on silicon wafers so we know really well how to use silicon germanium if you, if you switch to germanium uh, i'm not sure if you will be able to get better results and go further deep but uh, you will have to reinvent many of these technologies from scratch because it's an art as well as a science yeah that's what technology is so uh, so that's why we have stuck to silicon so now we are reaching the limits we, we're going to soon run into the pro problem of uh, electron tunneling tunneling through wall uh, through walls that's what happens and then that will give us results we don't want then there's also the process of the problem of heat so one solution is you take thus far we have two dimensional uh, circuits two dimensional microprocessors what if you make them three dimensional you take a silicon chip with all the uh, circuits etched onto it and you stack up these silicon chips so instead of a two dimensional square uh, processor you have a three dimensional cubical processor cube it's a cube and you can pack in so much more circuits into that the problem is that of heat how do we manage the heat just a small two dimensional silicon processor produces so much heat it's really really tough to keep a computer cool if you make it three dimensional it's going to produce an incredible amount of heat it may burn up the circuit it may melt things and uh, that's not what we want so that's the problem we will face when we have three dimensional processors the other possibility is to use is to ditch electrons altogether and go to photons photonics so when it comes to photonics you're all aware of uh, fiber optics these photon pulses here light pulses that we use for transmitting data uh, internet internet data and all that so you could possibly ex one could possibly explore ditching the uh, electron altogether and transitioning to photons photonics so photonic circuits but that is something that could possibly happen but it's it's a long way off other materials you could use instead of silicon and germanium could be carbon nanotubes or graphene graphene is a is is uh, sheets of carbon nanotubes carbon nanotubes are so what you do in nanotubes is that you take carbon atoms you arrange them in this hexagonal shape you create a, a, a surface you know two dimensional surface and you roll it up so then you get these very thin very thin uh, tubes called carbon nanotubes that could be a few microns long and they have very good uh, semiconductor properties and they have good great properties that could be very very useful for computing but once again that is still something that could be at least a decade or so off yeah so yeah these are possibilities that exist that will be explored graphene also has potential but it also has problems because graphene um, it gets damaged easily and you have to use it on some other material it has to be placed properly on the material you you create a strip of graphene you take it and you put it somewhere else it gets damaged and you could have holes in it and if you have holes in it you can do do computing properly and various other things so there are limitations there are problems the problems will eventually have to be overcome in one way or the other so one possibility is germanium one possibility is carbon nano nanotubes one possibility is graphene uh, you could even switch all switch over to photonics instead of electrons so light based computing photon based computing instead of electron based computing so in that case you will we will be able to ditch uh, copper wires and silicon wafers and you would have uh, fiber optics possibly possibly and there's uh, even more exotic things like dna based computers or something you know it's possible to store data in synthetic dna now is it possible to use it for computing maybe maybe so that's something that's even more you know left field than what what i've just discussed but yeah some of these are some of the possibilities that are being taken seriously not quite dna based computing but uh, carbon nanotubes graphene carbon nanotubes tubes graphene germanium and photonics that's what i can think of off the top of my head but 
we are certainly like you say ali that we are certainly reaching the limits the 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 limits uh, of what silicon can offer us and uh, sooner rather than later we're going to have to make some changes in if we want to continue uh, having more and more powerful computers and for moore's law to still apply okay tejas says can ai artificial intelligence replace jobs in creative fields so people have asked me questions about ai stealing jobs and taking over jobs yeah that's that's definitely going to happen but this is a, a different kind of question can ai replace jobs in creative fields jobs such as content writers graphic designers digital artists is ai unethical how can people save themselves from being jobless in the coming 10 to 5 years let's focus on the creative aspect of the question unethical technology is a tool a stick is a tool a stick can be used for ethical purposes and unethical purposes nuclear power can be used for ethical purposes and unethical purposes technology is amoral it is there is no good or bad right or wrong in technology it all depends on how it is used so ai is uneth- is it unethical no it's not unethical it's just a technology it all depends on how we use it the people who use it will either be ethical or unethical the uses will either be ethical or unethical the technology is is a uh, purpose agnostic it is amoral it's not immoral or moral it's amoral it has no morality it's just a technology now going back to the real question can ai replace jobs in creative fields yes so what we are finding now is that ai has most likely already passed the turing test what is the turing test it's when you have two black boxes behind one black box is an actual human being behind the other black box is a machine a computer an ai whatever you want to call it and you have a conversation in some form with both the black boxes and when your ai can have a conversation with an actual human being and the human being can't tell whether it's a human or a machine that's when the ai has passed the turing test and most likely from the news that's leaking out of google etc it looks like uh, the google ai uh, what it's called lambda is it it looks like it has definitely passed the turing test so we have breached that wall most likely yeah so we are now in the post turing test era ais have i'm not saying it's become sentient or conscious but it's certainly able to converse conversationally in real time with a human human being in a way that you can't tell if it's human or not it looks like a hu- like a proper human being no different from a human being so that's what's already happened now we are also uh, seeing all these new ais that come that are appearing you give the ai a bunch of text you describe what you want the ai to paint it will produce a digital painting for you and some of these digital paintings are incredibly beautiful and you can't tell that it's not a human being that's produced it yeah so we are already at the stage where ai can replace content writers it's able to create text that looks just like it's been written by a human being and and a well educated human being at that yeah so high quality content based on various keywords it's able to produce Hmm. so it can we have we have reached the stage where ai could very soon start replacing content writers yeah the services will soon be available for a subscription pay 10 dollars a month and you will be able to produce any kind of content you want original content yeah that will pl- pass any plagiarism te- uh, test so that is there graphic design very soon you'll have ai we already have ai that's, that's producing incredible art so maybe painters graphic designers digital artists could also be challenged by that i mean it would take somebody like pablo picasso or 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 vincent van gogh weeks possibly a week or so maybe two weeks maybe a month to produce a high quality work of art these ais can spit that out in minute, in seconds 10 seconds 20 seconds 50 seconds 60 seconds right so soon enough you will have a proliferation of these digital works of art from ais So the answer to your question they just is that yes ai can certainly replace jobs in the creative creative fields it is already reached the stage where we we will have artificial intelligence generated content high quality content sales letters newsletters what not yeah even novels who knows it's possible and digital art as well yeah so that's where we are how can people save themselves from being jobless in the coming 10 to 15 years by by acquiring skills that ai can't crack 
um so what are examples of that well you can become an athlete in ai can't be an athlete yeah you can be a leader ais can't be leaders as far as i know uh who knows even that could so we will have to we will have to think creatively and whatever uh fields or jobs are such that ai can perform them those will be replaced soon enough so that's where the people who are uh part of those fields are the ones who will be at threat of being replaced and being re- uh, rendered redundant so i think it's about acquiring new skills and staying on top of your game and going into fields that ai cannot penetrate so that's uh, where we are right now divya says what do you think of the artemis missions is it necessary to send people to the moon because it involves so much money and risk is there a solid reason to do that if it is not important to send people to the moon where do you think the money should be invested instead i okay 500 years ago the europeans started undertaking these incredibly expensive and risky voyages across the oceans christopher columbus he built these four ships the money for that voyage was given by the king and queen of spain they made a substantial investment into this incredibly risky venture that this guy proposed to them and he he promised them that there will be gold at the end of the of the journey right uh so there is a lot of risk involved in any new exploration any venture that involves exploration 500 years ago the oceans were the frontier that the europeans knew about we in india already knew about it but the europeans they were exploring oceans and it was very risky it it cost a lot of money to build ships to pay for all these journeys to to hire men to man the ships and so on now we are going across planets we going to the moon we want to go to the mars to, to to mars yeah so this is the new frontier space is the new frontier so we have spaceships we have rockets and yes they cost money it is risky in the past you went went to sea on a ship you could drown the ship could be sunk it it could be lost in a storm it could hit a piece of rock that you may not be able to see and many people died as a result you find shipwrecks all across the ocean floors it's a risk is the risk worth it it's for well it's for you to decide so it's all about balancing risk and reward what is the reward that i may possibly get for and for taking this risk right the risk essentially is calculated in terms of dollars and human lives also are, in, are are obviously they are at stake but the planners who plan this they typically think in terms of dollars human lives we have we have how many 7 8 billion humans a few here and there they will not really care about at the top level so the risk versus reward calculation is done and the question is when christopher columbus went out to look for india they all knew that india was incredibly fabulously wealthy so they expected that christopher columbus if he succeeds he will be able to bring back gold for us that's what the king of and queen of spain had calculated and that's why they they decided to fund his venture now when it comes to going to the moon what do we get there there's no gold on the moon so what is there there are other things the moon may be f- is known to be rich in various minerals its composition is in some ways similar to that of the earth so there is mineral wealth there is a lot of water there which is valuable in space and then there is the lunar regolith which contains an which is known to have a, an abundance of a certain isotope of helium which could be uh extremely valuable as a next generation nuclear fuel so there and and of course there is territory right now the moon belongs to nobody but once people start going there they will start claiming territory for themselves and demarcating territory so yeah territory is obviously valuable real estate is valuable anywhere in the world anywhere in the universe yeah so these are the reasons why people are interested in doing this and of course the 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 um, there's also the thought that humanity should have multiple homes just not just our planet because what if we mess up this, this planet which is kind of silly but that's also one of the arguments they make so it is not necessary to send people to the moon but it's desirable 
and Mars as well, because there are resources out there. There is real estate out there. You want people to, I mean, you you want your nation to be among the first ones to go and exploit and explore these resources and to to let's say stake claim on more territory beyond our planet, right? There are financial considerations, there are military considerations, there are geopolitical considera considerations, and all that. Humanity has always been a migratory species. We have always been explorers. So this is part of our nature. So is it necessary to send people to other places? No. But it's going to happen. It's always going to happen. If we don't do it, somebody else will do it and we'll be left behind. So it's always about getting there, getting there, being among the, among the first to get there. Why did the space race happen? Because the Americans and the, and the Soviets wanted to be the first and at the forefront of this. The, the Soviets were the first to, to launch the Sputnik satellite. And the Americans went into a state of panic because they could see the satellite circling the planet. They could hear it beeping. And they said, what if the Soviets place nukes on satellites? They'll be able to rain down nukes on us at, on demand whenever they want. So that's why we also need to get into this game. So the Americans and the Soviets had the space race. It culminated with the moon landings and so on. So when one nation does this, everybody else, whoever is capable, will try and catch up and, and possibly overtake, surpass the achievements of the other nation. That's just the nature of geopolitical competition. So it's not necessary, but it's going to happen. Yeah, And there are lots of solid reasons like I've just given you. Um, so I think it is indeed important for India, let, uh, let's me, let me speak, speak from India's perspective. It is indeed important for India not to be left behind in this matter, in the space race, in the moon race, in the Mars race. Because the technologies that you develop in the process of building these, these machines, these rockets and space exploration and all that, they help you in a variety of other ways. All these various spin-offs of space technology, they are all, over, all around us and we don't realize that. Yeah. And of course, these technologies also have a military dimension. So if you invest in a robust top-level space program, it's going to benefit you in ways civilians can't even imagine. It will benefit your nation, right? So that's why it is important for India to do that. Uh, India needs to ensure that it's not left behind. At the end of the 21st century, the two or three nations that lead the world in space exploration are going to be the two or three nations that lead the world and rule the world. So the question Indians should ask themselves is, do you want to rule or do you want to be ruled by somebody else? I think we have had enough of being ruled by others. Yes, thousand years approximately. I think it's enough. Please decide. It's enough. So India needs to be at the forefront of that. Even NASA is being asked questions that we are entering a recession. We have inflation. Why are you spending on space exploration? It has to be done. Everything has to happen in parallel. Yes, India is still a third world nation. Its economy is still growing. It will keep growing. But we, we also need to invest in space exploration. It is imperative that we are not left behind. So I think it is important to be to participate in the space race. It's important to be at the forefront, the top three of the space race, send people to the moon, send, send people to Mars, build more powerful rockets, do all that. doesn't matter if it costs money. Yeah. So the second part of the question is that. The, the answer to that is, there, is that it, it is important to do that and that money should be invested into space exploration. Vinu, my dear friend, again, today is Vinu's day. So what is the difference between chemical physics and physical chemistry? <laughs> well, actually, they're quite similar, but they're different. So what is chemical physics? Chemical physics is when you apply the laws and principles of physics to, to chemistry, to, chemi to chemicals, to understand how chemistry works. Yeah? You apply quantum mechanics, statistical matter mechanics, uh, atomic physics and molecular physics, condensed matter physics, and all these various disciplines and subfields of physics into chemistry. So let's say you want to understand why, you know, you know what water is, right? What is the chemical formula of water? It's H2O. So why is water H2O? Why did two hydrogen atoms come together with an oxygen atom and form a water molecule? Why is it so? To understand why it is so, you have to actually understand quantum physics or, or atomic physics. Yeah. And to understand atomic and molecular physics, you have to understand quantum physics. So a hydrogen atom is a proton, the nucleus is a single proton, and typically a hydrogen atom in the, in the most common 
isotope has a single electron that goes around the nucleus. You knock off the electron, you ionize the hydrogen atom, it becomes a single proton, it's a, it's a hydrogen ion, ion, right? It's positively charged. It's a naked positive charge. And to neutralize that, you have to give it an electron. You can share the electron with uh, something else, with another atom. So that's how, that's the basic principle behind the formation of, of uh, compounds, of, of uh, chemical compounds like H2O and all that. So to understand chemistry at this level, you have to apply the laws of atomic physics, molecular physics, quantum mechanics, uh, to understand the properties of chemical substances, you may have to understand statistical mechanics and condensed matter physics and so all, all that. So all of this, this is essentially a bottom up approach. You're studying chemical processes, you're studying chemical reactions from the point of view of pure physics. So that is chemical physics, right? Now, what is physical chemistry? It's, it's, and, and once again, about uh, about chemical physics, uh, one of the sub branches of quantum chemistry, one of the sub branches is quantum chemistry. So you uh, study chemistry not from the point of view of molecular physics or atomic physics, but from the POV point of view of quantum physics and so on. Now, when it comes to uh, physical chemistry, so physical chemistry is is the study of the large scale macroscopic properties of, of chemical substances and chemical systems. So you're studying the, the properties, you know, if it's a solid, what are the properties of the solid? Is it crystalline in nature? Is it amorphous? Is it something else? At what is the boiling point? What is the what is the boiling point of this thing? What is the what is the vaporization point of the, the this substance? Why is it this way? Is it ferromagnetic? Is it something else? And so on and so forth. The large scale macroscopic properties of chemical substances, chemicals, and chemical systems. That is physical chemistry. That is not chemical physics. Yeah, two different things. But there, there is some overlap between the two, and uh, physical chemists and 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 uh, I mean the the scientists who study and work in these two fields have some things in common, and they can certainly have interesting conversations with common interests together, right? So that's the difference and the similarities between physical chemistry and chemical physics. Captain Burp says, two questions. Firstly, what's a cryogenic engine? What are the working principles? And why is depleted uranium used in tank shells and other things and not radioactive when used? Okay. Okay. What is a cryogenic engine? A cryogenic engine is a rocket engine. Now, what do we mean by cryogenic? Cryogenic means something that has very low temperatures. So a cryogenic engine is an engine that uses cryogenic fuels, fuels that have very, very, very low temperatures. Typically, the cryogenic threshold is 120 Kelvin or minus 150 degrees centigrade. Yeah. So a fuel, a liquid fuel typically, whose temperature is below 150, below minus 150 degrees Celsius, that is a cryogenic fuel. And typically, a cryogenic engine, a cryogenic rocket engine uses cryogenic fuels, extremely cold fuels. So the simplest and one of the best cryogenic engines, I mean, two of the best fuels in cryogenic rockets are liquid oxygen and liquid hydrogen. You bring, bring them together, ignite them, they will produce extremely high temperature steam. So you see various rockets that use these uh, fuels liquid oxygen, liquid hydrogen, they are essentially giving off water vapor at extremely high pressures and temperatures. So the boiling point of hydrogen is minus 250 degrees Celsius, approximately. And the boiling point of oxygen is approximately minus 180 degrees Celsius. So these are two cryogenic fuels. So any rocket engine that uses cryogenic fuels is called a cryogenic engine. Now imagine how difficult it is to build to, to, to design and build such an engine. It uses incredibly low temperature fuel, incredibly low temperatures, less than minus 150 degrees Celsius. And yet it produces an extremely high pressure, high temperature flame, exhaust. Yeah. So on one, so if you have a cryogenic engine here, the fuel flows in from the top, let's say extremely low temperature and the output is this incredibly high temperature 
jet of exhaust and you have to somehow build an engine that can handle both kinds of temperatures and doesn't explode doesn't blow up doesn't uh, malfunction so it's it's extremely hard to do that and that's why cryogenic rocket technology is something that is uh, very highly sought after and very few nations have the capability of of developing cryogenic engines so i don't know how many nations have developed this the us the ussr now russia the uk had it they scrapped it because the americans made them scrap it the french have it india has it the Ch- the chinese have it the the japanese have it and uh, yeah as far as i can think of yeah so these nations have cryogenic rocket uh, cryogenic engine technology so that's what it is now depleted uranium what is depleted uranium so when we talk about uranium let's say we talk about the natural uranium that we that we are able to extract out of uranium ore that is uh, available naturally in some places so when we talk about natural uranium it's about 99.3% uranium 238 it's 99.3% uranium 238 uranium 238 is one kind of uranium isotope yeah so natural uranium is 99.3% u238 it is 0.7% roughly uranium 235 and there's a very small trace amount of uranium 234 so there are three isotopes uranium 238 uranium 235 and uranium 234 the most abundant isotope 99.27% is uranium 238 but the one that we want the one that is valuable is uranium 235 it is the fissile isotope of uranium it is the isotope that is used in nuclear weapons and nuclear reactors so when you have reactor grade uranium it's about 5% it has about 5% uranium 235 when you have highly enriched uranium it's about it's more than 20% uranium 235 and when you have weapons grade uranium it's 90% or more uranium 235 right so it's a very rare isotope but we need lots of that to have a uh, weapons grade uranium now what is depleted uranium in depleted uranium you have less than 0.3% uranium 235 so you don't want the fissile isotope you want the the non fissile isotope you want it to be mostly uranium 238 so depleted uranium has less than 0.3% uranium 235 okay it's, it's it's very high density material it's almost uh, twice as dense as lead so lead in case you have ever seen lead it's a very dense metal very heavy a, a small piece of lead if you try to lift it up you'll be shocked at how heavy it is yeah it will be just this size you try to lift it up it will be like what what is this how is it so heavy so lead is very dense and lead is typically used for uh, as as a radiation shield in physics labs and and uh, medical labs etc so uranium so depleted uranium is almost twice as dense as lead and that's why it is also used for radiation shielding when you have high intensity gamma rays uh, other things like that so one of the uses of depleted uranium is for radiation shielding that is a civilian use but you also have military uses of uranium of of depleted depleted uranium one of the uses is armor plating let's say you have a tank will tanks go into war they have a high likelihood of being hit by projectiles so you can use depleted uranium in the armor plating of tanks especially if you can angle it at a certain angle then it's even more effective instead of having these straight lines i mean the 90 degree angles so armor plating is one application one use of depleted uh, depleted uranium the other use is armor piercing projectiles and bunker busting missiles and projectiles so because it is so dense it can uh, punch through armor so let's say once again let's say you have a tank that doesn't have a depleted uranium shielding it has your regular steel shielding or whatever material they use chobam is it i'm not sure whatever they use so if you have a projectile let's say a bullet heavy caliber bullet or a, a shell a tank shell or or any other projectile that has a depleted uranium tip it may be able to punch through the shielding 
or if you have a bunker that is let's say 10 meters underground yeah and one of the evil leaders of the third world nation is is hiding under there let's say saddam Hussein was hiding under a bunker if the americans wanted to take him out and if they knew the location of the of the bunker and let's say it's 10 meters underground so it's shielded by 10 meters of earth or maybe 10 or maybe 20 meters of earth and maybe it is it is encased in concrete even then if you have a high velocity projectile with which is made up of depleted uranium it may be able to punch through the 10 meters 20 meters of earth and even punch through the concrete shielding and explode inside the bunker you also have various aircraft hangars that have that are made up of reinforced concrete so even if you hit it with with a, a tank shell or whatever it may not destroy the aircraft inside in that case if you have a depleted uranium projectile it may be able to punch through the shielding and destroy the aircraft inside so these are some of the uses of depleted uranium like i said it's almost twice as dense as as as, as lead i think uh, overall uranium natural uranium has a density of about 18000 or 19000 kilograms per cubic meter what does it mean let's say you have yourself a cube made up of natural uranium and it is one meter in dimension so one meter height one meter breadth and one meter length that sort of cube if you have a cube of that size made up of natural uranium it's going to weigh almost 19,000 kilograms 19 tons if you have a cubic meter of water it's going to only weigh 1000 kilograms compared to 19000 kilograms of uranium iron around 8000 meters gold about 19000 slightly more than uranium and the densest element we know of is called osmium and if you take a cubic meter of osmium it weighs about 22 and a half tons approximately yeah so that is what it is. That's what depleted uranium is. And that's why it's used in tank shell, anti-tank shells and all that. It is not radioactive. It has a very low concentration, very low percentage of the radioactive isotope, the fissile isotope, uranium-235. And that's why it is not it is not radioactive uh, anywhere as, as much as uranium-235 or natural uranium. Okay, next question. Shiva Satya says, can you please explain the different black hole type, the different types of black holes, Schwarzschild black hole, Kerr, uh, Reisner Nostrum, Kerr Newman, what's the behavior and effect of each type of black holes in the surrounding, surrounding universe? I may have taken this question in the past, but for the benefit of newer viewers, here we are again. Um, there are four major types of black hole. The Schwarzschild black hole, the Reisner Nordstrom black hole, the Kerr black hole, and the Kerr Newman black hole. What are the differences between these two? The standard, simplest black hole you can think of is a Schwarzschild black hole. It is an uncharged and non rotating black hole. Yeah. And that is the Schwarzschild sol solution to the Einstein field equations. So a Schwarzschild black hole has no charge and it has no rotation, it has no angular momentum. It is a non-rotating, uncharged black hole. Yeah, a Reissner and a Schwarzschild black hole is perfectly spherical. A Reissner Nordstrom black hole is also non-rotating. It has zero angular momentum, but it is charged. It has some charge, right? Then there is something called a Kerr black hole. The Kerr solution to the field equations that is a rotating black hole. It has angular momentum, but it has no charge. So this is not going to be perfectly spherical. It's going to be oblate. It's like, it's like a squashed sphere. That's the shape of this black hole. And then you have the Kerr-Newman solution, the Kerr-Newman metric, which is a charged black hole that also has rotation, that also has angular momentum, right? So these are the four different types of black holes. Now, when you have a Schwarzschild black hole, it has no rotation, so it does not drag space-time with it, yeah? So when you have a black hole that rotates, it actually drags space-time with it. Space-time is not just curved, it is dragged along with the rotation. So that is the effect it has, and, and that is something you can study further if you study general relativity. So these are the four different kinds of black holes, and uh, depending on the charge and the angular momentum and the lack of it or the presence of it, you may have different effects on the surrounding space-time and, and other objects near it. So if you have a black hole with charge, it's going to 
have electromagnetic lines of force which will affect charged objects in its vicinity or even far away or even at infinity and so on. So that in short is the answer to the question. Now there are other types of black holes as well like there is something called an extremal black hole. So an extremal black hole is is a black hole that has the minimal possible mass compatible with any given charge and angular momentum. So let's say you have a black hole with a certain charge and a certain angular momentum. The black hole with the minimum possible mass corresponding to that charge and that angular momentum is an extremal black hole. So that's the extreme case of a black hole with those parameters, right? It's called an extremal black hole. And it is possible that the entropy of a, such a black hole could be equal to zero. Possibly, possibly. Yeah, that could be so. So these are the different kinds of black holes. Okay. Vinu says, can you briefly describe the interior and exterior layers of our sun? Why and how is the lower atmosphere of the sun, the chromosphere, cooler then the outer atmosphere, the corona. Yeah, the corona is, is hotter than the chromosphere, weirdly, right? Okay, let's take a look at the sun. Let's see what the layers of the sun look like. Sun layers. And let's put that on the screen. Let us put that on the screen so that you get a visual representation of what the layers of the sun look like. Okay, let's go to images. And let us see the first image. What does it show us? So this is roughly the kind of uh, internal structure the, uh, the sun has. So at the center of the sun, you have something called the core of the sun. Yes. So the core of the sun is over here. So the core of the sun is about, about 200,000 kilometers in... Uh, in radius and its temperature is about what is the temperature the temperature is about is about 15 to 20 million degrees centigrade that's how the, hot the core is then you have the radiative zone which is about 300000 kilometers in in radius yeah it is that that's how thick it is and its temperature is about 7 million degrees celsius then you have the convection zone the convection zone over here and the convection zone is about 200,000 kilometers thick and its temperature is about 2 million degrees Celsius. Then you have the photosphere, which is part of the atmosphere. That is only about 500 kilometers thick. It has a temperature of about 4 or 5 or 6,000 degrees Celsius. Above that, you have the chromosphere, which is about 1,500 kilometers thick. It's got a temperature of about slightly higher, near 8,000 degrees Celsius. And then you have the corona, the outer layer of the sun. And the corona can go up to 1 million degrees Celsius. Ridiculous, isn't it? So that's how it is. Now, why is it so? Now, first of all, you have to understand certain things. First of all, uh, we see light coming out of the sun, yes? The light that comes out of the sun is in the form of photons. These photons are born inside the sun, in the inner layers of the sun, in the core of the sun essentially, right? So the nuclear reaction that gives rise to photons, that gives birth to photons is called the proton-proton chain. It is the backbone of nuclear fusion within the sun. It gives off neutrinos, gamma rays, two things. It also is what, see inside the sun you have plasma, ionized hydrogen. It's protons and electrons floating around in extremely hot temperatures and very densely packed together. Right, so then you have this uh, this nuclear reaction called, which is called the proton-proton chain, in which essentially uh, is the fusion of hydrogen into helium. Yeah, and it gives off neutrinos, incredible amounts of neutrinos, which we experience all the time, which we which pass through us all the time. Solar neutrinos. It also gives gamma rays, produces gamma rays. So essentially, every single second, every single second, about five million tons of matter are being converted into energy in the core of the sun. Not every day, not every hour, every second, 5 million tons of matter are being converted into energy. That energy eventually makes its way out in, in the form of light. But the photon, the gamma ray photon that is born inside the sun, it takes 
maybe a hundred thousand years, maybe a million years to come out. Because inside the sun, the the the, the protons and other other particles are packed so closely together that a photon can only travel a, a millimeter or two before it hits a proton, and it keeps hitting these protons. It keeps getting absorbed and re-emitted, absorbed and re-emitted. It, gets, it keeps getting, it keeps hitting all these obstacles and it it takes an incredibly long amount of time. You can calculate roughly what the time is for the photon to come out of the sun. It will first be born inside the core then it will go into the radiative zone. It will spend thousands of years there. And every time it hits a, fo- a proton, it loses some energy. So gamma rays are the most energetic photons. If you look at visible light, it has a spectrum. The red end and the violet end, right? The red end is low energy light, low energy photons. The violet end is more energetic photons. Then you have ultraviolet light which, that we can't see, which is which is higher energies. Then you have X-rays, which are even higher energies. And then gamma rays, which are the highest energy photons. So inside the sun, you have the formation of highest energy photons called gamma rays. These gamma rays undergo incredible amounts of collisions inside the sun with protons and other other subatomic particles, mostly protons. This process lasts thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of years. Yeah, And it's only about roughly a hundred thousand years or a million years afterwards that the photon emerges out of the interior part of the sun, goes beyond the convection zone and and exits through the photosphere. So So the light that we see was born hundreds of thousands of years ago inside the sun. But once it exits the sun, it takes about eight minutes to reach the earth. Right, so that's what we have. Then we so so the atmosphere of the of the of the sun is the photosphere, the chromosphere, and the corona, and we are not quite sure of why it is that the corona of the sun has a temperature of about a million degrees Celsius, but the photosphere and the chromosphere are much cooler. Photosphere about four or five thousand degrees Celsius, the chromosphere maybe seven or eight thousand degrees Celsius. Celsius. So why is the chromosphere and the photosphere so much cooler than the, than the corona so and this is something we observe not only in the sun but most stars seem to also have this phenomenon so the process is not really well understood maybe it is because of the uh, because of magnetism the sun has a very very powerful magnetic field and you have these magnetic tornadoes that that are that are, that emerge out of the sun maybe it is the magnetism that is uh, heating up the upper layer, the corona of the sun, to that temperature. Maybe, uh, yeah, maybe there is a possibility. So the process is not quite understood. It is still. It, it was first discovered, I think, in the first half of the twentieth century, that the corona is much hotter than the lower levels layers of the atmosphere. So maybe it has something to do with magnetism. Maybe there is some other process that we don't quite understand. But yeah, it is one of the existing mysteries of the sun. So as you can see, even the sun, which is something we see every day, we don't quite understand that as well, as much as we would want to. So there is a mystery right there in front of us. The temperature of the corona. Why is it so much higher? We don't know yet. Okay, Samarth says, what exactly are ice cores? How long can they last? So what are ice cores? We have places on our planet where where you have glaciers and thick uh, layers of ice. If you go to the Arctic Circle, most of the land is covered in ice, very thick ice. The ice can be hundreds of meters thick, maybe kilometers thick. You go to Antarctica, you have ice sheets that are kilometers thick, most likely. So if you were to drill down into this ice using drilling technology, then you can pull out various sections, cylindrical sections of this ice at various depths below the surface. Yeah, These cylindrical sections that are pulled out through drilling are called ice cores. Yeah, So if you go to Antarctica, you may have an ice sheet that is maybe, let's say hypothetically, two kilometers thick. Now, it is possible to determine the rate at which ice uh, ice sheets fo- form. So 
it's like sedimentation on the planet you drill under the planet and you see the cross section you are essentially looking back in time each layer of sediment represents a certain time period of the earth's history similarly if you go if you drill a ice core in the deeper you go the deeper back in time you're going so let's say you drill 100 meters down and hypothetically if you add 10 cm of ice per year hypothetically and you're drilling 100 meters down so 10 cm per year which means in 10 years you will have 1 meter and you're drilling 100 meters down so that's a 1000 years so the ice core that you will get at that depth of 100 meters will be about 1000 years old roughly and and you can see the effect of seasons etc on the ice cores you will see various sediments that are the result of the various seasonal fluctuations you can determine how much carbon dioxide was in the air at that given point in time you can even detect unknown volcanic explosions eruptions yeah in the in uh, there are there are that leave behind the signatures in the ice cores and so on so that is what ice cores are how long do, do they last they last as long as the ice sheets last yeah so that's why ice cores are important you can actually go back in time and see the, how the climate was 1000 years before today 2000 years before today depending on how far below the surface you can drill and that tells you a lot about the history of our planet the climate of our planet we can detect volcanic eruptions that may have happened in the past and you may even be able to perhaps determine where they happened and so on so that is what ice cores are that's why they are important that's why people uh, go and study them and uh, yeah so that's what it is okay bengal tiger says what is a shooting star should we ask for wishes yeah wishes i don't know about but what is a shooting star let me show you what a meteor is a shooting star is a meteor let's put meteors on the screen meteor so this is what you see so if you have access to a patch of sky with low light pollution if you go there at night and you look at the sky for one hour you're going to see multiple meteors for sure guaranteed i'm not sure if any of you has done that i did that as a kid you spend an hour gazing at the sky when you don't have light pollution you will see multiple meteors at least five or six meteors so this is what a meteor looks like this is a brilliant example beautiful example of a meteor this is obviously a very very bright and large meteor it's green in color so a meteor is a piece of space rock that enters the atmosphere and burns up in the atmosphere now why is why does it glow it's because meteors typically travel at very high speeds between 20 to 70 kilometers per second yeah and because of this extreme speed when they enter the atmosphere they produce friction they encounter the molecules of air in the atmosphere and because it's it's traveling so fast it squeezes the air in front of it and the squeezing produces heat very high amounts of heat and that heat first melts the rock and then vaporizes it so typically most of these space rocks they they burn up in the atmosphere only if a space rock is large enough like significantly large will it actually impact the surface of the planet most of it burns up it happens all the time all the time it's happening right now as you speak there will be meteors in the sky so that is what a meteor is right it's it's not a shooting i mean it's called a shooting star colloquially it's a meteor it's a piece of space rock space debris that burns up into the atmosphere in the atmosphere and it has various colors based on the chemical composition of the rock itself so the color that you're seeing here is greenish yeah greenish bluish that means it's a magnesium meteor it is a meteor that has a significant amount of magnesium that's why it's greenish bluish if you have a violet meteor it means it has calcium in it it has significant amounts of calcium if you have a reddish meteor it means it has either significant amounts of oxygen or nitrogen and if it's a yellowish nice yellowish meteor it means it has sodium so depending on the color you can tell kind of what the chemical composition of the object was right so that's what a meteor is should you ask for wishes it's your choice you want to ask for wishes go for it i'm not sure if it's going to have any effect but it will make you happy so do it udit says is it possible to shoot films in space just like russia is planning to do i'm not sure what russia is planning to do but of course you can shoot films in space uh cameras will work in space um uh, 
and there's plenty of footage of people in space in the on the space station uh doing space walks uh astro- astronauts bouncing around on the moon so you can certainly uh film what's happening in space you can enter, you can if you have the resources you can even film an entire movie in space why not and many of the modern cameras they work very well in space most of them work very well in space if you have a gopro i have a gopro somewhere you have a group gopro it will work well in the vacuum of space it will work and i'm sure that asteroid uh, astronauts must have used gopros during space walks mm-hmm. so yes it is certainly possible to shoot films in space you can film entire movies in space mm-hmm. yeah it's possible especially now that uh, space launches are, are becoming more and more are becoming cheaper because of space x what they are doing they have far surpassed isro in the uh, in the uh, what shall i call it the amount of money it it takes for them to launch something into space the amount of money per kilogram of payload is the lowest when it comes to spacex so yeah it will be possible soon maybe for filmmakers to actually go into space and and shoot things there yeah maybe it will possibly be, be possible soon so the answer to this question is yes yes karan says what is the scientific method of learning well there is something called the scientific method which is uh, which is not the scientific method of learning is the method of uh, doing scientific research that's a whole different thing but what is the scientific method of learning i mean if i am an individual i want to learn things do studies do learning what is a scientific approach towards learning something there are some very simple and basic concepts the first thing is don't believe people's opinions only trust hard experimental data and and empirical evidence yeah so in indian philosophy i don't know i don't remember which school of philosophy it is it says that there are multiple kinds of evidence multiple kinds of evidence exist in the world yeah they are called pramanas pramana so the the best form of evidence the most superior form of evidence is pratyaksha praman observational evidence something you can observe something you can replicate that is called pratyaksha praman observational evidence right so that is the best form of evidence you can rely on that then there is another form of evidence called anuman which is inference or logic so based on what i have observed i can infer something or i can use the i can use logic to make some inferences that is called anuman anuman is is also good but it is not as great or as good as observational evidence then you have shabda praman which is people's opinions look everybody has an opinion everybody has a nose similarly everybody has an opinion even great scientists have opinions that have turned out to be wrong so opinions must not be trusted blindly yes if a very accomplished person a great scholar has an opinion you should take it very seriously but always remember that even the greatest of people can be wrong in their opinions so when it comes to evidence observational evidence empirical evidence is the most trustworthy the next most trustworthy form of evidence is logic and inference based on observational evidence not based on opinions and then opinions are also to be considered but not given that much weightage so if you have this clear hierarchy in your mental makeup you will go well with your learning right so that is the scientific approach to learning and you can apply that to the learning of history yeah when some famous people say that this thing happened but then you find the evidence that it did not something else happened then you must disregard their claims and their opinions only trust actual evidence hard evidence archaeological evidence doesn't lie geological evidence doesn't lie it's there it's it's in stone right written evidence written at the time something happened that is way more trustworthy than the opinion of some phd scholar today and so on and so forth so that is the scientific approach to learning always emphasize hard evidence you can only trust hard evidence 100% even then you have to realize that hard evidence itself can be manufactured or or or, or forged so all, you have to be on the lookout of these things for for these things right and then you have to learn using well pattern recognition that takes a lot of time 
So, but this essentially, in 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 brief, is the scientific way of learning anything. <laughs> Nishchay says, Dr. Nishchay says, what is current science? Why is current science fiction mostly dystopian as opposed to earlier versions which were so hopeful and exciting about the future? Are we really heading towards a dark and ugly future? See, most science fiction comes from the West. Most science fiction that we in India consume and most of the world consumes comes out of the West. In the 1950s, 1960s, the West was very positive. The society was, was doing very well in the US, in, in Western countries. Uh, they had one the Great War, the Second World War, their economy was booming. They had all these nations that they could control. So they had a very good view of the future. So if you see the science fiction from that time, from the 1950s, 1960s, you see a very nice, optimistic worldview, a very optimistic, envisioned future, space exploration, people going to other planets, other worlds, meeting aliens, and, and good stuff. Overall, the tone was very positive. Then you see the science fiction becoming darker over time. And that you see not only in science fiction, you see in other genres also. Take Batman, for instance. Batman. Most of you who watch Batman movies today will feel that Batman is a very dark character. Very dark and very gloomy character, a mentally disturbed character with, with psychological issues and stuff like that. There was a Batman, the original Batman that I watched was a series that was filmed in the 1960s. Which year was that? 1966. Okay, 1966. And take a look at what that looked like. Let me put that on the screen. Yeah. Does this version of Batman look dystopian, gloomy? It does not. Look at the Joker. Look at Batman and Robin. This was a very light-hearted original version of Batman. Gotham City had criminals, but they were funny criminals and they could be easily beaten. And they were not as evil as the, the, the same criminals, the, the way they are portrayed today. Look at them. And if you see the, the, you can see various clips of this on YouTube. It's really funny, very lighthearted, very positive. That is the, the series I watched as a kid. I was not born in 1966. I watched it much later. But, <laughs> but yeah, that's the Batman I watched. And if you see Batman today, if you just uh, remove the 1966, see it today. Good God, how dystopian, how disturbing it is. It's a very dark, gloomy uh, look. Very dark, gloomy world. Everything is negative. There is no positivity in this. So that's what, that's the way Batman has evolved over the decades. And that's the way the science fiction also has evolved. The writing, the movies, everything has become darker and darker, uglier and dystopian. And the elements are all negative elements now. So when I say I don't enjoy Black Batman anymore, some people get upset. Oh, it's a great movie. I'm sure it was great for you, but you have not seen what I've seen. My perspective is, is a much broader perspective, which you may most likely not have. So don't react to what I say emotionally. Somebody asked me about the scientific method of learning. The scientific method of learning is please put your emotions aside. If you come up, if you come across new information that is at odds with what you have learned thus far, don't react emotionally. Please stop being emotional. Indians are so incredibly emotional. Why? Why? Please learn something from your ancestors. Stop being so emotional. Be a little more grounded. If you come across new information that is at odds with what your teachers and your elders and your society has taught you, breathe. Lambi saas lijiye. Do 60 seconds of pranayam. Then look at it again. Right? And think about it. Think, Analyze it logically from the perspective of actual hard evidence. Don't believe people's words and opinions. Everybody has a nose. Everybody has an opinion. Right. Okay. So anyway, coming back to this. So that's why um, science fiction nowadays is so dark and all that, because Western society is slowly declining. You can see more and pro more problem problems every year. In the 1960s, even in the 1990s, you would not imagine people pooping on the streets in the US. Today, homelessness is rampant. People are actually pooping on the streets. San Francisco, Los Angeles, those cities, can you believe it? And so many other places. Overall, the society is crumbling. There are so many divisions in society. 
there is there are there are all these hatreds today so all of that is is spilling over into literature into movies into all these different genres including science fiction so what's happening is that the western society is heading towards more darker times we can see it happening in real time now yeah it doesn't mean the whole of humanity has to follow them indians love to ape america stop doing that please stop doing that we can build our own future which has nothing to do with their future right so be positive be optimistic watch good movies movies should make you happy or they should make you think they should not leave you with a sense of gloom and foreboding you go and watch a movie you walk in happy you come out with this dark cloud over your over your head <sighs> what's the point so watch good movies it's fine to watch movies that have various dark themes but overall there should be some point to it not just to to make people unhappy and all so yeah so my point is we are not necessarily heading towards a dark and ugly future not necessarily yeah it's a, so we don't have to follow what they are doing and ape them sanat says what's your view on neil degrasse tyson as another astrophysicist so i typically don't express opinions about individuals because individuals don't matter but in the rare case of somebody who really does matter i will talk about them yeah so neil degrasse tyson i said tyson i believe is one of the most influential and most important scientists of our time uh from the perspective of of uh of influencing so many people right he has had such a massive positive influence on society at large uh he has popularized astrophysics and physics and science overall to an incredible extent i don't think anybody has contributed so much towards doing that it is not enough to simply uh come up with new research one of the most important thing things a scientist can do is to inculcate the love of science in other people especially youngsters children teenagers etc you know because that's where the future scientists will come from and many of them will have the aptitude for science but they will not realize it until you make them fall in love with science so that's what neil degrasse tyson has been doing so for for so many years he's a brilliant speaker he explains complex things so well so simply using analogies and all that it's a lot to learn from him for anybody who wishes to be a science communicator or or scientist yeah so i think he's a brilliant guy very very important in influential scientist and uh, somebody who comes along only once in a while so yeah i do admire him a great deal okay i think we are at the end of today's questions let me take two three questions from the chat can you explain a little bit of astral projection i don't even know what that is i don't think it's something to do with science it's something to do with uh, spirituality and mysticism so i apologize i personally know nothing about it unfortunately okay what next ask abhijit nasa's james webb space telescope discovers dis- detects carbon dioxide in exoplanet atmosphere this is not a question this is a statement and i the statement is uh, is correct it was one of the wasp planets i believe it is a gas giant as far as i remember and the telescope has been able to detect the signature of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere of this exoplanet so yes it isn't it true but i don't see any question in there all right what's a rogue star how does a star become a rogue star i think a star can become a rogue star if it behaves like a rogue which means it is very naughty i don't know i'm not sure what a rogue star is i'm not really quite sure what that is uh what are masons masons are people who who build walls and buildings masonry that's what masons are all uh, right what else mm, is there anything else is there anything else i have answered this question multiple times what is my opinion on vedic rashmi theory the vedic the so called vedic rashmi theory first of all it doesn't exist in any of the vedas it is not vedic it is something that somebody has created in recent times and there is no science in it a law a theory of physics needs to have needs to be based in mathematics it needs to be able to explain observational evidence can the vedic rashmi theory explain 
chemistry can it explain cosmic microwave background radiation can it does it do that can it explain the motions of the planets in the solar system can it explain various quantum effects electron uh, tunneling for instance quantum tunneling can it explain quantum superposition can it explain any of these things can it explain why the moon and the sun, and the earth and the moon are in a in a resonant state why we only see one face of the moon and not the other one can it explain any of these things a, a good theory should be able to firstly explain everything we know about the universe thus far and secondly it should be able to make predictions about things we still don't understand and thirdly it should be falsifiable and fourthly it should be based in mathematics i have tried to look up this thing i have been able to find no literature on this anywhere people point out that some book has been published i tried to look up the book it cost 10000 rupees a good physics theory a scientific theory should be available for free for everybody to consume yeah and and uh, understand so i i am able to find none of these things so as far as i'm concerned this theory is neither vedic it is no neither is it a scientific theory as far as i can see i apologize to those whom i have offended i know we are all very emotional people if i point put forward my perspective people are going to get offended they're going to react emotionally abhijit you or this abhijit you that apologies but i stand by my words all right okay my dear friends my dear friends thank you very much for another wonderful session and we shall continue this i will see you in tomorrow's live session which will be on geopolitics and current affairs and history until then take care and i will see you soon thank you bye bye